Thank you now. Good afternoon. I'll try and speak up because I think their speakers have got more horsepower behind them than ours have, actually, listening to that. Um, very quickly, we were asked to touch upon a few topics which are exercising our clients on a regular basis. And at the moment, I'm probably getting more phone calls and emails from clients around CCG posts and how they're taxed. Because from the 1st of April, GPs are now finding that actually they can't any longer simply have the practice invoice the CCG and get paid gross. They haven't had pay as you earn operator. They're saying, is this right? Well, I think the first fundamental is that last October, the Inland Revenue looked at the position of GPs who were appointed to a board under a CCG's constitution. And they ruled that such a GP would be an officer. That doesn't mean they're an employee. It simply means they are taxed under pay as you earn in a similar manner to an employee. It might look like an employee, but the Inland Revenue are not determining employee or self-employed status, merely saying, whatever you are, you will be taxed under pay as you earn. Now, that causes all sorts of problems because Class 1 national insurance has to be collected, so there is a 13.8% burden on that, and the GPs quite naturally say, I don't want that paying. Mm, hard luck. There's no option around that. I want to share the income with my practice because I don't want to drop my sessions permanently because I'm only doing this for a couple of years and I want a way back into practice. Okay, well it can be shared. Uh, you can apply for an NT tax code, which means no tax is deducted. Sadly, national insurance will still be. Pension is the big issue. If a GP is an employee, and that's determined by the contract, which Amanda um, will talk about later on, if he's an employee, then the pension will be dealt with under the payroll system, and therefore that income will not count towards seniority. If, however, they are self-employed, they might still be taxed under pay as you earn, but the contract is a self-employed contract, then the pension can be dealt with through the GP solo form mechanism. And that means superannuation and seniority in particular are not affected. So there's all sorts of um, conundrums about, are they an employee? Are they self-employed? Does it matter? What happens if they're an employee, uh, for, obviously for tax purposes, but not for pension purposes? It's messy. But uh, I, that's an area I think of interest. Probably the next most common is, um, Bob, we've got lots of young GPs getting a bit nervous about owning surgeries. Um, they think it's less risky to be a tenant rather than be a property owner. What do you think? Well, in my view, the risks are merely different. There are risks to surgery ownership, but there are risks to being a tenant under a lease. Um, as I'm sure Ollie will tell you later on, a lease is in place for the length of that lease. The fact that circumstances change, maybe CQC makes your building completely inappropriate and your contract is withdrawn, the landlord won't care two hoots, you will continue to pay the rent until that lease expires. So the risks are different, they don't disappear. Leases often have restriction on changes of use, and landlords can be very tricky about that. If you own your own surgery, within the planning legislation you can do what you like. But if landlords have to approve every change you want to make to the structure of the building, then that's a different issue. Because often such approval will come with a request for a cheque to sweeten the decision. There are two types of lease which Lolly will, Ollie will doubtless talk to you about. A full repairing and insuring lease. Avoid those like the plague. All right? That means whatever happens to that building, it's your fault, you pay the cost, even if it was badly built to start with. I would normally expect nowadays GPs have simply internal repairing leases. You're, in you're required to keep it up to a good order internally, but that's as far as the obligation goes. Also increasingly with the challenge of replacing retiring GPs, you want to make sure that when a GP does come to retire, they are able to be excused from their obligations under that lease. Now, if you've got a 10-partner practice, that would be dead easy to do. If there's a three-partner practice, that might be a different kettle of fish. Because if you can't find a partner to replace the third one when he goes or she goes, the landlord might not be happy to let them off. So they could be on the hook for the rest of that lease, even though they retired years ago. So the risk is different. It's not removed entirely. The other area that we're getting comments about is GPs, strangely, don't like their tax bills. I'm paying a lot of tax, Bob. Yeah, welcome to the club. We all are. Um, can I use a limited company? Because I think I, I don't pay as much tax then, do I? Uh, well, do you want to take the money out of the limited company? Of course I do. I've got to pay the school fees and I've got to live. So, yes, I want the money out. 
Well, if the money simply goes through a limited company and then back into your pocket, frankly, there is limited opportunity for saving tax. So limited companies, for many GPs, for their core practice income at least, is, are a red, heading, red herring. Some bright sparks say, well, can't we put the whole practice into a limited company? Maybe. The challenge is, if you've got a GMS contract, there is no transfer mechanism. There is no way you can, in a bulletproof manner, get that contract moved to a limited company from your partnership without the very strong risk of the local area team putting it out to tender, because they're scared stiff that somebody like the major corporates will shout foul that you put this contract to another company without them having a chance at it. What about surgery ownership? You know, some accountants will say it's very efficient to own a surgery through a limited company. And in some instances it can be, but the challenge is surgery ownership is generally financed over perhaps a 25 year period. And a lot of accountants will say, looking at the numbers on year one, it's more tax efficient to run this through a limited company. And in 25 years, the surgery will be all paid off and there'll be, be free equity. What they fail to do is recognize that actually in a particular partnership model, there will be individuals wanting to retire at different points over that 25 year period. And you need to look very carefully at how a partner can exit after 5, 7, 12 or 15 years. I have some practices where I've taken this scenario over and they're frankly hamstrung because they, they, they cannot get an incoming partner to raise the money to buy out a partner who wants to go. It worked at year one and it'll work at year 25 but it doesn't work in the middle. So limited companies have their place but they're not a no-brainer by any means. And the little red light hasn't come on, so I'm still within my five minutes, so I'll cut it short at that point. Thank you. We're just going to press straight on through all our speakers, and then we have an opportunity to have a, a decent Q&A session. So next up, um, it's Amanda, uh, around issues around employment law, uh, HR legal things. Is that right, Amanda? Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Um, I'm Amanda Chadwick. I'm a speaker for Peninsula Business Services. Um, and uh, we work with, um, I think, we're nearly 20, over 26,000 businesses. And 70% of our client base actually is the care sector, doctor surgeries, and we work with the MDU. And what we try and do, I have to say, as a speaker, when I've been speaking to doctor surgeries and health organisations in the past 20 years, really, it's only re really, I'd say, in the last eight to 10 years that doctor surgeries have taken and health organisations have taken employment law seriously. Uh, hot topics we've got on our advice line at the moment um, are burnout within uh, the NHS, medical and care sectors. So we're talking about capability there, stress, sickness, long-term sickness, um, also so I don't know if you know, but one of the biggest complaints in tribunal is actually the working time directive, which is breaks, it's hours, it's holidays, and that really ties into depression, stress, and burnout. So that's a really big topic at the moment. The other topic we always get asked about, actually, um, on our advice line, and it's the top topic that we get asked by HR professionals and managers and owners, is how to hold the disciplinary. Um, so that's always a very, very big common topic. Um, hot topics at the moment we're seeing on our advice line when it comes comes to employment law HR issues is social networking, mobile phones and in fact I can talk about a doctor's surgery um, in the UK, I'm not going to tell you whereabouts, where a lady sat there as a receptionist and literally a Hollywood star walked into the uh, doctor's surgery and, um, and asked for his mother's prescription. And as soon as he walked out, you know, like a human being, was quite amazed that a Hollywood star had walked into her doctor's surgery. And she picked up a mobile phone out of a handbag and she texted the world on Facebook, guess who's just walked into my doctor's surgery to pick up a, a, a prescription. So we're seeing huge problems with social networking and mobile phones in the workplace. What we want people to do is make sure, we know it's frustrating all the red tape. We know, and you know, that it, there's the law to have certain things within your policies and procedures, but you've got to keep Keep abreast of that. Just because you've got good stuff doesn't mean to say you're not going to have a problem in the future. Other hot topic is always change in terms of conditions of employment. And I know in uh, medical practices, you might have somebody who works a Monday, Tuesday, and then you have somebody that works a Wednesday, Thursday, and the person on a Monday, Tuesday, for example, has bank holidays, and they're not included in their annual holiday. They get them above it. So it's change in terms of conditions like that. Always get questions about that. Um, recent 
recent webinars that I run for free have been on burnout, have been on stress and depression, have been on sickness, have been on change in terms of conditions, um, social networking, mobile sites. Um, there's lots of different policies and procedures to have. But just to say, the minute I walk through your door as a new starter on day one, when you are recruiting somebody, I do have over 78 rights the minute I walk through your door. And quite often you can't tell anything about anybody. And also, if you're still asking people about the health, when you're asking them about the job and you haven't offered it them yet, you're out of date. That's illegal to do. And there's certain things that people don't know, such as lifting, carrying for a pregnant person. And it's keeping abreast of what the employment law and health and safety legislations are. So... Um, I'm going to be on the panel now. Ask me anything about employment law. There doesn't have to be specific subjects, but any issues you might have and you just want a little bit of an answer on, I'm here to reassure you. And also, if you want to link into any of my webinars, they're free. Uh, approach me at the end. I'll get you onto one of them and you, you can hear me at your desk for 40 minutes talking about a certain subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. So hold your questions just for a little bit longer. Well, next up is Oliver. Uh, so issues around uh, corporate governance and commercial law and all that stuff. Is that right, Oliver? Uh, yes, in five minutes, exactly, yeah. Um, my name's Oliver Pritchard. I'm the head of the commercial health team at Brown Jacobson Solicitors. Um, my team advises a range of NHS trusts, um, the commissioning board, CCGs, and also non-NHS providers of healthcare services. Um, I didn't realise we had an expert in stress counselling and um, burnout, but after the last few months, um, with the advice we've been giving since the 1st of April, I think I might need to arrange a personal consultation. Um, just to give you a flavour of a couple of the sort of topics where we're getting lots of um, queries from, from commissioners and from GPs. The first one Bob's already touched on, which is around this whole issue of how do practices and GPs that are engaged within a CCG... Um, how are they remunerated for those services? And Bob's already outlined the, the basic tax rules that apply where you're an office holder. So if you're the chair or if you're a governing body member and someone from your practice is performing that role, it's very clear, the law is very clear that you must be taxed as an employee. Um, an interesting area, sort of a little spin on that, where we've been doing a lot of work recently is where GPs are providing services to a CCG, but not office holder services. So they might be on a working party or a subcommittee in some other capacity involved with the CCG. And there's not a lot of guidance in that area. And our view, at least, um, until any sort of further guidance comes out, is that you've got more flexibility in that area to arrange the relationship on a sort of consultancy basis. So if, for example, a GP from your practice is going to provide services on a working party but they're not an office holder so they're not formally part of the governing body um, if you want a kind of arm's length consultancy type arrangement with payments gross rather than tax through the payroll there is some scope and I'm sure Bob will be able to sort of advise more on the tax side of things but there is some scope to, to structure things and in that way and that's certainly one area where CCGs have been looking at um, those arrangements and then just to very quickly m mention another area where we're getting a lot of queries is around GP provider groups GPs coming together, forming companies, um, ready to bid for services, which, um, you know, there's certainly a belief that there's going to be more services put out to tender, and GPs kind of getting organised, ready, so that they've got a, a vehicle ready to bid for those services. And, you know, in the new world, they might be bidding against pharmacists, against Virgin Healthcare, against lots of other organisations. And it, sometimes when a tender comes out, that's too late to start thinking, right, we better all get together and form an organisation here to, to bid for those services. So a lot of work with setting up companies, and I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A about some of the issues that, um, that arise in that area as well. Um, so I think it's time for the Q&A. OK, C come on back then, Oliver. Do have a seat. So um, it's unusual to have three such experts sitting in front of you and you're getting free advice. Um, so, um, questions, thoughts? Anyone got issues that they'd like to, to raise via, via our experts? Okay, so can I ask when you put up your question, please make it brief, and do you want to sort of direct it at one of our experts initially anyway, and then we can work it from I've there? I've got two questions. The first from Amanda, what was the name of the Hollywood star? Sorry? What was the name of the Hollywood star? <laughs> And of Hollywood the, confidentiality. the second question on locums who are so-called self-employed, when are they self-employed, when they're not, when are they employed? 
Okay, well, what we would say with tax, uh, I'm sure uh, Bob would say with tax, uh, it's totally different law to what it is with employment law. And a, genuine self a genuinely self-employed person, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a contract for services. I'm looking for the fact that you're saying that they work for other people, that they're actually invoice you for their work, um, and that there's you know training given or they're not wearing a uniform, and it's really clear the relationship you've got. Um, there is some frustration with this because what we find is that quite a few people that work in any industry, not just in uh, GPs uh, uh, or care sector, is that they do fall into the worker category, category which enables them to have you know extra rights. Um, but so uh, usually what we find is a contract for services in place clears up the clear water, clears it up, and and, and states really if they're genuinely self-employed. Does that answer your question? Okay, can I just uh, any any comments from my other colleagues on any of those areas? I think it's I think it's worth talking about the tax position because the revenue stance is that they're still happy with locums being treated as self-employed, where they follow the traditional model of stepping in the shoes of an absent doctor. What they don't like, though, is regularity. That they've historically been very happy with maternity leave. Up to six months wasn't an issue. The question of whether the increasing 12-month maternity leave is still going to be comfortable with them is still a bit undecided. The challenge is, in, re in reality, regularity. So if you've got a regular Tuesday morning locum who comes in pretty much every week of the year, the Inland Revenue could quite, re quite reasonably challenge that and say, why is this not an employee? But the traditional peripatetic locum who flits in and out to cover sickness or the odd holiday is still fine, but long-term is increasingly dangerous from a tax perspective. Okay, uh, over there. Yes, it's for Bob. With the CCGs, with GPs working for them, in the case of a partner working... Sorry, can you hold the mic a bit yeah. closer? In the case of a partner working for the CCG and the payment going to the practice... How is the tax standing on that situation? Okay. At the moment, the, if, they're, if they're a board member, then pay as you earn will be operated. If it's going to the practice, so it's shared effectively as practice income, the, the national insurance that's deducted would be all allocated to that individual GP because it would reduce the amount of overall national insurance they have to pay on their self-employed income. You would normally apply for or get your accountant to apply for an NT tax code saying that this was pooled income and therefore the inland revenue would generally say no tax has to be deducted. But the challenge is until the, the CCG has operated the payroll at least once, the RTI links won't have been made. So if you were to apply to a, the inland revenue, you'd say, but this doctor's not working for this CCG, we can't issue an NT code until they are. So there's always one month at least where there's tax deducted, NT code hopefully would be issued fairly promptly, and on receipt of that, the tax would be refunded. So the payment that would come into the practice would have had class one national insurance, but no tax deducted. Uh, any, any other comments from colleagues around that? Okay, uh, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm an appointee on the uh, CCG board as a practice manager, and I've been told that my um, the pay that I get is not pensionable. Is that correct? And is there any way around it? Because uh, I'm, I'm paid by the CCG. It doesn't come through practice accounts. It, it, it's not NHS pensionable. They're very clear on that. You can only have one NHS post pension at a time. Um, conceivably, the CCG could make a payment into a private pension scheme for your CCG income. If, if you are an employee being paid directly, um, I'm, I'm assuming you are being paid by the CCG rather than you're technically seconded, so it's not going through the practice, you're, you're getting a separate payment from the CCG. Yeah, the statement for NHS purposes is correct, but you could say, actually, I want you to pay into a private pension for my CCG income. It might take them a bit by surprise, but there's no reason why they shouldn't do that. And have, sorry. And have an NHS pension as well? Yeah, the, the two can run in parallel. Okay, can I just say, if there are any personal thorny issues that you wish to address, you might want to speak to these guys after after the session. But but if we... Uh, okay, the lady, uh, lady behind you, thank you. Um, just one question about the locums. Uh, th working through limited companies, uh, doctors with different speciality, not necessarily to be a consultant nor a GP. Uh, we are facing um, basically... Um, 
a trouble here because we are stuck. Um, all these contracts, for either for GPs or um, consultants, to be employed through the, the GP contract. So, um, uh, the, uh, surgeries, even if uh, ask us to do some sessions, there is no pension, no uh, help with revalidation cost, uh, no supervision, and um, they just want us to cover some work, and that's it. So, where is the law here? How can we defend ourselves? Is that one? Is that is it, would that be for Amanda? Do you think to uh, the question was how does the employment law help locums? Yes, or Bob, I think if 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 it is working through a limited company for a doctor, it's just um, there is a, a, a very difficult situation. So I mean, the, the biggest issue from from my perspective of a locum running through their own limited company is that they're not because that locum company won't have a primary contract with the NHS they can't pension that income under the NHS pension scheme. So normally the only people I would find doing that are individuals who are perhaps only here for a comparatively short period and deliberately don't want to pension their, their income through the NHS. If it's a question of that's the only way the practice are prepared to employ you, mm -hmm. I think at that point it's more of a legal and HR issue and I'll pass swiftly to my left if I may. And it goes back to yeah. the, the whether an OCOM is full time, you know, a, a, an employed person or self-employed or a worker. And I think for most GP practices, they're using them as a self-employed person, so those benefits would not be applicable. If I can just add to that, I mean, in, certainly in the case of larger providers, and, and um, I'm by no means a pensions expert, but my understanding is that there are changes that will allow um, wider access to the NHS pension scheme for non-NHS bodies. So if you're talking about a, a company that um, provides a, a range of services, employs a lot of staff, there is going to be more flexibility for those staff to have access to the NHS pension scheme than there has been in the past. But, you know, now the market is different. There is, um, um, the payment per hour is less. The jobs available, it is less. No travel costs, no accommodation. The, 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 the sessional work doctor need to cover all this. And then there is no support with, with the revalidation or the, um, any payment. And there's no pension. So if we are stuck, I'm not, I'm not speaking about myself. I have colleagues in the same situation. We found ourselves either to continue and giving a label, not a GP, not a consultant. We are doctors here working in the UK for many years. If nobody is speaking and tell, tell, tell anybody who is, is in charge to do something, then okay, well, maybe what we can, can we do? Maybe we pick up some of those issues out, out, out outside of the session. But thank you very much for raising that, uh, that, that difficult problem. Okay, so we've got some, uh, some questions over that section, haven't we? Could, could, just, could you help us by just directing it to a colleague here so that we know where to start off with? Yeah, this is a question for Bob, I think. Um, uh, my GP partners are um, worrying, shall we say, and it's probably an understatement, about all the, the changes in the superannuation um, rules and arrangements. I'm just wondering whether you've got any clever ideas for avoiding um, getting taxed on annual allowances, lifetime allowances, and what have you. What's the best way forward? I've got three GPs in the late 40s. Okay, the annual allowance oh, one. You need to bring that a bit closer. Sorry. The annual allowance question, the new limit from next April will indeed have a lot of GPs affected. At the moment, a GP is able to come out of the pension scheme temporarily. They can defer their pension. So arguably, if you have a GP who wants to stay in the pension scheme but doesn't want to have uh, a tax penalty, they could, for example, defer their pension on the 1st of January and go back in on the 1st of July. So they've been out for six months, spread over two tax years. So for those two tax years, they will actually pension three quarters of their income for each of those years. Now that might well be enough to drop them below the point where the annual allowance is triggered. So that's a fairly straightforward mechanism. There are impacts on their benefits for death in service whilst they're deferred, so they need to take advice, but that's a practical mechanism. The lifetime allowance is a slightly more complex situation. There are some IFA, IFAs who will say, actually, if you look at a whole life valuation of, of your pension fund, because the NHS pension is index linked, which over a 20 or 30 year life post-retirement will be extremely valuable, 
you're probably better over a whole of life basis to actually ignore the lifetime allowance and just carry on building up your pension scheme. Now, that never goes down well, because in my experience, my GP clients would rather walk through fire than pay any tax they can possibly avoid. But that is rather a short-termist view. But the annual allowance, there are things you can do to mitigate that. Okay, um, we've probably got time for one more question. So I think I'm seeing a, a, a hand up here. Okay, well, we'll pick both if they're brief. So, um, okay, we'll, we'll sure. get you in just a second. It's a question to Bob. Um, can the rental income on a uh, GP premises be put through a, a corporate vehicle, a limited company? It can, as long as the limited company actually owns the surgery. Now, the challenge with that is that it switches from being uh, a trading surgery, so entrepreneur's relief is applicable for capital gains tax to being an investment property, so it's less attractive for capital gains tax, and also there would be a stamp duty land tax charge on the transfer into the limited company ownership. So the answer to your question is yes, but you might not want to do it in an existing situation. Okay, final question. Final question for Amanda. Uh, my name is Julie Davidson. I'm a practice manager in North Somerset. We're interested in federating and being able to move some of our staff into other sites, other practices. What would be your tips for us to consider before we actually start those sort of arrangements? Well, it's to look at what terms and conditions you have in place already and what their statutory main terms say. I would like to see a mobility clause in there that enables you to do that, but there shouldn't be a problem as long as it's quite local to where you are, but you need to consult on that. Um, and, and that's it really. So are you opening up another practice or are you nearby? No, federating with other practices. Oh, right, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. As long as the terms and conditions are met, you've consulted, it's a business need, that shouldn't be a problem. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we're, uh, we're out of time. So a big thank you to, uh, to Bob, Amanda and Oliver. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to you for listening. And I think if you want to catch any of these uh, people out, out it'll have to be just outside because we've got a whole crew coming in for the next session so so thank you very much for me for all three of you thank you